Now let's take a look at hydroboration oxidation for an alkyne. And again, it's something we looked at with alkenes. And with an alkene, typically the reagent of choice was BH3 borane uh, with THF. And it might have been B2H6 without the THF. Uh, and then you add hydrogen peroxide under basic conditions, so with NaOH typically. Uh, and in that case, it adds H and OH anti-Markovnikov, so the OH on the less substituted side, the H on the more substituted side. Well, with alkynes, we have a directly analogous set of reagents. In fact, you might still use BH3THF, but you'll get a better yield oftentimes if you use what we call a bulky borane. So in a bulky borane, uh, replaces two of the hydrons on boron. So notice this boron only has one hydrogen with a couple of big carbon chains. And the most common one in most classes is what's called a, uh, isoamyl groups. And we call this disiamyl borane. And disiamyl borane here, we'll see a picture of it later. Uh, but in this case, uh, it'll go anti-Markovnikov. But the, the big thing here is that with an alkyne having two pi bonds, to prevent it from reacting twice, uh, you might recall that with alkenes, every boron got to react, uh, every borane, I should say, BH3, got to react with three alkenes, uh, losing one hydrogen in the process. But if our boron only has one hydrogen to lose in general, then it can only react with one equivalent, uh, in this case, of an alkyne rather than alkene, but only one equivalent, and only once. Uh, so we limit the reaction only once, but we'll find out that this will indeed again go anti-Markovnikov. So here, the less substituted carbon's got the OH, and the more substituted carbon has picked up the H. But again, we formed an enol here, and that's just going to be the intermediate most of the time, and it's going to tautomerize, forming our keto product. But our keto product technically here is an aldehyde. So when we do this with a terminal alkyne, we can talk about Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov, and how this is an anti-Markovnikov, just like it was with alkenes. And when you do it with a terminal alkyne, you get the aldehyde instead of the ketone. Uh, like we saw in the last uh, acid catalyzed hydration reaction. Uh, this is a syn addition, but it's not something you're likely to have to worry about in this case uh, after tautomerization and everything like that. Um, but one thing to note, this tautomerization is going to happen under basic conditions, whereas the last one happened under acidic conditions. We'll find out in a little bit that the mechanism is exactly backwards uh, between the two. And those mechanisms are things we'll study in a little bit because they're something you're probably going to need to know. Uh, one other thing to note, in addition to disiamyl borane, you might just see this written as R2BH, or you might see specific R groups like cyclohexanes or, or something like this, cyclohexyl groups, uh, or a couple other examples. And we'll see what those look like here shortly. So now if we look at hydroboration oxidation with an internal alkyne. So again, with an internal alkyne, your two sp hybridized carbons are equally substituted. And so anti-Markovnikov and Markovnikov, nothing to even, uh, no relevancy here whatsoever, nothing to talk about. So in this case, whether we do acid catalyzed hydration or hydroboration oxidation with an internal alkyne, there's no Markovnikov or Antimarkovnikov, so you get the same products either way. And if you've got an in asymmetrical internal alkyne like we do here, we'll get two different enol intermediates, regioisomers, that lead after tautomerization to two different ketone products as well. Uh, so, and again, had we used instead of uh, our hydration oxidation reagents here, had we just used H2SO4, we would have got the same ketone products in the end. So for an internal alkyne, it doesn't matter which set of reagents you add because Markovnikov and Antimarkovnikov are irrelevant. It's only for terminal alkynes that you can see the difference. Uh, and in this case, one other reminder, if you have an internal alkyne, unless it's symmetrical like this guy here, that's when instead of getting two different products, you'd only get one. So here we'd get at six carbons and we could put the ketone third carbon from the left, or we could put the ketone third carbon from the right. But whether you put it three from the left or three from the right, that's the same ketone. And so in this case, instead of getting two products with a symmetrical internal alkyne, you're just going to get one. So for hydroboration oxidation here, I want to show you what some of these bulky boranes look like here. So this is disiamyl borane here. Uh, you might even see it drawn out above the reaction arrow instead of actually given the uh, the lovely condensed formula here. So, but this right here is an isoamyl group. When you've got two of them, we call it disamyl borane. You might even see it written out, so you might want to see it recognized that way as well. This is disiamyl borane. So the other common bulky boranes that you might see, 9BBN. So, and you're just going to see it written as 9BBN. That's obviously an abbreviation, but this is the structure. Notice that your boron only has one H and the boron's got bonds to other carbons and is fairly bulky. So you might also see dicyclohexyl boron. And again, boron's only got one H and then two big carbon chains here. Or you might just see it again written out generically here, R2BH uh, instead. And technically that might be with or without THF, most likely with, uh, in all likelihood as well. Those are your bulky boranes. Just want to make sure you've seen them once, uh, just in case uh, 
one of the less common bulky brains shows up in your class? 